Hey, deserving listeners, today's episode is about ChatGPT, which is developed by OpenAI. In this episode, we are going to delve into the psychology behind ChatGPT and its impact on our understanding of artificial intelligence, human interaction, and mental health. As a language model that can understand and generate human-like language, ChatGPT has the potential to revolutionize the way we communicate with machines and each other. It can also provide personalized support and guidance, which we'll get into. It can generate creative content, which has its own implications, and it can even have conversations with people, Mm. which is interesting. We'll get into that. But with these advancements come important questions around the psychology of the interactions between humans and machines and machines and machines and humans. How do we perceive and respond to ChatGPT? How do we form emotional connections with machines? What are the ethical implications of relying on machines for emotional support and connection? Throughout this episode, we will explore these questions and more, diving into the psychological underpinnings of ChatGPT's abilities and the potential impact on our mental health and well-being. We'll also examine the ways in which ChatGPT could be used to enhance mental health treatment and therapy. So join us as we explore the fascinating world of ChatGPT and the psychology behind this cutting-edge technology. Welcome to the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda, and the entire introduction was, was written by Chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> I, I changed it a little bit because yeah. it was obvious, but but pretty much yeah, at least yeah. the outline yeah. is, is all there. Uh, who are you, Berto? My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I develop bottomless socks. I mean, it's pretty wild, right? Like, yeah. I just typed in provide an introduction to a psychology podcast about Chat GPT, right. and 90, I don't know, 85% of it is there. And I had to spruce it up with my own, if I just read it, it would have sounded really dry. Right, right, right. But I had to kind of sprinkle in stuff, you know, sprinkle in some humanness. But honestly, I, you know, I've messed around with ChatGPT and other AI bots over the years and thought that it was impressive, the ChatGPT, the fourth version that they're at right now, I think. Yeah. And, uh, but I had no idea because at, at first I was thinking, well, it can't write a podcast and, and it certainly can't like right now we're in the non GPT yeah. side of the podcast. Well, like, you think this might all be AI generated voices. <laughs> could a chat GPT write an intro or give you an outline, a rough draft of an introduction? Yeah. But that's just an introduction. It doesn't right. give you the meat. It doesn't give you the emotion or the empathy or the personality or the human ability to draw connections and inspire people or educate. But it is impressive. Well, and I, I'll say, you know, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll potentially disagree on this, but uh, I think it, we're, it's not far off from doing all those things. It's just that my opinion is that um, the Psychology in Seattle podcast is one unique podcast. There are other unique podcasts. Just because you can have one unique podcast doesn't mean you can't have another unique podcast. So just because an AI can generate a pretty work of art or an interesting story or a podcast doesn't mean that that's the only thing you can have, right? You can have another one that was created by a human that you might like more or less or the same. And so even when the AI achieves that level of uh, being able to create a whole podcast that sounds fine and interesting, it doesn't mean that now we can't. Because, you know, today we are competing against other podcasts and we still do it. Yeah. But are you contending that ChatGPT would be able to write a podcast Uh, that would be interesting? In a few iterations, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd love to see it. Yeah. I, I'd love to. See, I'm sure it's 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 uh, you know it'll happen at some point. Yeah. But I have a hard time believing at, at its current state that without significant massaging yeah. by a human being who knows because right. creating a podcast is hard for intelligent right. human beings. Totally. Yeah. No. The current one can, but it would be it would. I think a lot of people would be able to tell. Oh, okay. I think that's AI. Also, generated. I don't think it'd be very interesting. <laughs> Well, like depends. the, a lot, the a lot dryness of, of the responses. Although, you know, I will also say yeah. that I, I, I also typed in a bunch of quite, I was actually prepping for other episodes and there were some emails from the listeners yeah. and I just copied and pasted the mm-hmm. questions from the listener, you know, complicated clinical questions right. into chat GBT. And the answers were, were not bad, but they were not elaborate, but they weren't bad. Right. And I was surprised because if you go on the internet and just ask these questions, you know, yeah. what do I, like one of the things that I asked is what is codependency? Right. Which if you type that question into the internet, you're going to get some massively wrong answers. Right. Right, right. But 
I typed it into chat GPT, which of course is just trolling the internet, right? But it has to prioritize and weight certain things, yeah. I'm guessing. It's not even, I mean, it, it's literally predicting statistically what it should say one word right after the other. And it seems like, you know, it seems like magic. Like, well, how could that work? But when you have all the data <laughs> and all the processing, it works well enough. <laughs> but you would think that chat GBT having been deciding on its quote unquote right answer based on what's available in the human discourse of a particular construct called codependency, you would think that some elements of the bullshit would shine through and it didn't, yeah. you know, it, it, it really zeroed in on the specificity that I've been talking about, about codependency. Others have too, but it's kind of buried underneath a lot of bullshit on the internet. In this case though, they did pay a, a whole bunch of humans for a long time to give it feedback as well. Oh. So the version we see now that we can interact isn't just the raw output of- But still, even that. But still. Because most yeah. people, yeah. I, most clinicians oh, in right, my right. anecdotal experience don't know what codependency right. and is. And I don't mean they had, you, you know, they didn't have experts in every field giving feedback. Feedback, That's right? what I'm saying. Right. You know, yeah. that it's such a specific yeah. Uh, yeah. expertise yeah. level of <laughs> of ability. So, yeah, I mean, ChatGBT is, it's impressive. I mean, yeah. it is a massive leap forward. And I think I am welcoming what it can provide us in a variety of ways. But uh, we'll get into that. What did what did you want to get into today? This was your idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I have a few things. Uh, so my, my thing is I've been fascinated with AI since I was a little kid. Uh, when I was about 10, I got into computers, maybe 9, 9, 10. Uh, in fact, the first thing was my my aunt brought a calculator from the United States down to Colombia to give to my grandpa. And it was a Radio Shack calculator that you could program in basic. You can make these little simple basic programs. Mm -hmm. And again, this is just a calculator, not even a full computer. So you it had very little memory and stuff. But you can make simple little basic programs. Oh, yeah. And my grandpa didn't really know what to do with it. So he's like, I don't know, give it to a kid. Oh my God. If, <laughs> if I had that when I was 10, I would have right? I would have nerded out on that totally because I, I was I had limited access to yeah. computers in in grade school of course and the very few times I did get access you're like ah, salivating yeah, yeah. I, I I can remember specific moments like a friend of mine you know him Glover yeah he had a Commodore sixty four and it oh. had had the tape deck that oh, you I could one that of those. you could load <laughs> you know you literally had a a cassette tape that you had. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you basically were modemizing into yeah. this 64 kilobytes or what the, would it be? The Commodore 64 had 64K. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Is that what it was? So yeah. you would 64 load. 64 kilobytes. Yeah. And you could program in basic. And so I would spend the night at his house and I would basically just play in his Commodore yeah. 64 while he was like, Kirk, let's do something else. And I'm like, no, nope. I just want to play with your... And it was fun because you could load the programs and then edit like random stuff on them and then you'd run them and the blue colors were red or whatever. Yeah, it was it was crazy. Yeah. I didn't own a Commodore 64. A cousin of mine did. And when I visited him, I was always like, ah. Yeah. But I didn't have a computer even in my house, you know, that yeah. I had access to until the early 90s. Oh, man. And I didn't have my own computer until right. I think 98 or something. Okay. So I got a little, quite, quite a bit lucky, especially for living in Colombia, that these things were arriving from the States. You know, my aunt brought that thing down. And then she gifted me a computer, a, a Tandy Color computer a few years later. So anyways, I got into computers and I started reading everything I could get my hands on. I competed in contests down in Colombia. I actually took third place in the national contest. And the only reason I didn't get first place is because I didn't listen to my dad who had warned me leading up to the competition. By the way, I don't know if he had heard something or whatever. He's like, you should study your geometry. And I was like, dad, they're not gonna ask me geometry. It's a computer contest. Yeah, why'd they ask you about geometry? I, I, I know how to program, it's fine. We got there, I did. I ace all the first stuff. We get to the final thing. Write a program that takes a side N of a regular polygon and calculates the area. Oh. And I was like, gosh darn it. And I had to refigure it out by hand before I could write the stupid program. So I finished it, but I was one of the last ones. And so because of that, my points went down and I got third place, but still got third place. So I was very into this stuff. I remember reading in one of the many books I had about This it. is in Bogota. This is in Bogota. So I, by now I'm about 14, 13, 14. 
I remember reading that there was this big debate in the field of AI that had raged on for long before I was even born. Uh, and the debate was on one side of the fence were these folk that wanted to figure out intelligence through rules. They thought we could figure out the rules of intelligence. And once we do, we can program them and then we can have intelligent machines. And on the other side were these folks that were like, I don't know if we can do that, but we could like train a, a computer on, on, on data, you know, and have it learn from data. And I don't remember exactly how, how they wrote it, but those were the two philosophies. Well, I don't know which one this fits into, but the current model is, is data. <laughs> well, but more specific, my, I don't know how people describe it, but the way I describe it is you create a program or a thing that is able to learn essentially. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get to that. But basically the approach is what I, at, at that age said, yeah, of course you want the second approach. What you want is a baby. Right. You just want a baby that can look at things and form connections and and go. With, with feedback, with feedback. We'll, be able yeah, yeah. To, we'll be able to orient itself in a particular direction. Right. And you won't know the same as with a baby. Right. You don't know how you don't it, know. it learned to put know. those things <laughs> exactly. together, but you taught it how to learn and exactly. it learned. And so now, of course, I didn't know anything at the time. And really, honestly, the only reason I got lucky with my intuition was because I was lazy. I, in my mind, I was like, oh, coming up with all the rules for how one thinks seems daunting. Yeah. And so. <laughs> I, I, I think I had heard of that debate maybe in the 80s. And I think I figured it was the rules that would have to be made. Because, and, and, and because it, it's, it yeah. stood to reason, you know, right. that if you just created a lot of rules and a lot of if then statements and a lot of sub right. if thens that eventually you'd be able to pass the Turing test. And course. that was winning. That was what was happening. Yeah. That's how IBM beat uh, Kasparov. Right. Rules. Okay. So zooming back, there is this thing called a perceptron, which is essentially a concept that was invented in the in 1943 by these two dudes, McCulloch and Pitts. Uh, and there were researchers and, and, and they, they basically proposed a perceptron as kind of a, a digital neuron. Now it was a very vastly simplified neuron, so it wasn't, they didn't have all the understanding of what everything that a neuron does. But essentially what it was is, you have a thing with multiple inputs, like dendrites, with multiple inputs, and those inputs can be on or off, right? And then the, the body, the body of the thing, which would be the neuron body, but in this case, it's just a, a part of the program, it's going to do something with those inputs. What it's going to do is it's going to multiply each one of those inputs by some weight. And the weight, we don't know yet what the weight is, but just it's just a number. So we got a whole bunch of inputs. We're going to multiply each one of the inputs by a weight. Then we're going to add that together. And if the output is greater than something, we'll say, we'll, we'll turn on the light bulb. If it's less, we'll turn off the light bulb. And it, and it was basically like that. Inputs go in, you multiply them, you add them. You might modify them by an additional value. And then depending if it's higher or lower, you are a one or a zero. And that simple concept. Were they trying to emulate neurons? Yeah. Okay. They were literally trying to say, okay, well, a neuron has these inputs. Uh, something happens here where some of the inputs are weighted higher than the others. And then the neuron either fires or it doesn't. And so they, they came up with this simplified model. They called it a perceptron. And a few years later... Uh, they a, a totally different team implemented a, a version of this. They made a machine that could look at a, a at an image of 400 pixels, basically, and do some basic image recognition. Now, this is in the 50s. So think about, like, when you think, when was the first image recognizer trained? Like, it's in the 50s, right? And so there was all this excitement. In fact, the quote from the time from this guy Rosenblatt, who implemented this thing, the embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. That was how he would describe what they had built in the 50s. Of course, he was a little ahead of his time. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's when you, you don't know what you don't know, of course. So right. when you see certain uh, advances, right. like... A common one from our lifetime was in the early part of the 20th century, you have early flight. You have 
balloons and then you have the Wright brothers and then you quickly move on to giant, to, to yeah. well well right I mean but yeah. you go to jets right then right, right, right. you have rockets and then by 1969 you're on the fucking moon man. right like 69 yeah. 1969 well before computers are yeah. the way they are today you know it's it, the 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 advances were going so fast. So you think, well, by the year 2000, we'll right. surely be among the stars, Space right? Space-faring civilization. Just look at the progression of, of things. Uh, of course, by the at least the year 2023, we'll have colonies on yeah. Mars and other places. Totally. But the barriers, they were unknown to them. Not only just yeah. like cosmic rays and solar radiation, which is a total problem as soon as you leave our ionosphere right. and our atmosphere, but also the economics of it you know right. getting to the moon is a thing <laughs> but getting to mars and getting people there yeah. is just like it's exponentially yeah. more expensive it's, and it's, it's not crazy. involved in we, we're no longer in a cold war race with no. the soviet union trying to outdo them for our very ex existence so there's not a, a need right, for right. any country to invest that much money a hundred percent and and you know when just staying with that for a second um, everything that was that was done between like okay we got a wheel okay we got a car okay we got a plane also it's all still within our atmosphere and our living conditions right and there is this whole other thing to either going to the bottom of the ocean or leaving our atmosphere that all of a sudden we can't survive in those environments so you add all that extra complexity but so yeah right so this person Rosenblatt and all the folks at the time that were looking at these developments I mean think about it you just basically just simulate it in their minds, right? That you simulate a piece of a brain in the 50s. Like, that's crazy. Okay, but as you would imagine, the this didn't bloom immediately because computers couldn't do much. These were very, very, very primitive computers by today's standards. As you know, room-sized machines that could add two numbers in an hour, you know? <laughs> All right, and then in 1969, the kind of the final nail in the coffin, but of course it was a temporary nail, uh, to this whole line of thinking was was put by a famous uh, AI researcher named Marvin Minsky, and someone you might recognize, Seymour Poppert. He was oh, Seymour Poppert is uh, not just computers. He was like kind of a neuroscientist or whatever. I knew his name when I was a kid because my dad had some some books on the shelf by him or something. In fact, one time when we were talking about Piaget, I got one book confused with. Seymour Poppert, I think, or something like that. So in, in either case, these guys published a book called Perceptrons. But in the book, they were basically arguing that Perceptrons had some hard limits to what they could do. And so that they, in essence, they sort of weren't the route towards true artificial intelligence. Because these were mechanical neurons? No, it wasn't that. It, it's that uh, there were... There were legitimate arguments at the time they just they just hadn't really seen the full picture uh, so one thing that is key to computers is a what's called an exclusive or circuit an exclusive or is when it's kind of the way we talk about or in in english when i say hey i want an apple or an orange like you're like do you want fruit yeah give me an apple or an orange now you know that if you give me an apple i'll be happy if you give me an orange i'll be happy if you give me nothing i won't be happy and if you give me both, I might be happy, but I said only one fruit, so you're probably only gonna give me one fruit. That's more of an exclusive or. I'm gonna get an apple or an orange, not both and not neither. That's an exclusive or. Well, that's a circuit that in computers is very important. That's like computers basically work with exclusive or circuits. And they proved in this paper- Zero or one. It, it basically, yeah, that if I, if I give you uh, one, one, that should be zero. If I give you zero, zero, that should be zero. But if I give you one, zero, or zero, one, that should be one, right? Okay. Well, they proved in this, in this book that the type of perceptrons at the time couldn't do these exclusive or circuits. So they were like, look, this is pretty limiting. Plus, they, they had some other reasons why these things were limiting. However, that was not the end of the story because there were, there were tweaks that you could make to these circuits to actually give them the ability to do exclusive or and then go beyond that. But the field stagnated and everyone else started doing uh codifying rules 
and that became the big hot thing. I don't know if you remember in the eighties, the, the the buzzword was uh, uh, intel or what was it called? Expert systems. That was expert systems. So they had like medical expert systems, and and it was all rule based. Yeah. In, in other words, if people are having a hard time following it would be in the medical field a lot of if then statements yeah. that experts will code into the program so you have a patient that comes in and says and the it says do you have a medical problem you say yes and then it routes you to an, a question does it involve it's sort of like 20 questions exactly does it involve <laughs> your stomach no does it involve your head right. yes does it involve a headache? No. Does it involve your eyes? And you know, it sort of gives you. And then eventually, it starts to ask you: Have you been drinking today? Do you have a, a history of such and such in your in your family? You know, and that and, was really useful for those applications. Yeah. Because and then, it's, it, and then it, at the end, it presumably it routes you to a professional or right. gives you a treatment or something. Because honestly, that is how humans do it in those fields. Like, you know, a doctor pretty much uses a whole bunch of if-then statements to well, figure out Well, do they? Because that, that's a question. Well, because it, I, you, I mean, you can argue it, that it, it, the way they would describe it would be that way, but the way that it ends up being acted out is nuanced and biased. Totally fair. Yeah. Let's take something maybe a little more, literally more mechanical. Uh, you know, a production plant where you have, uh, you know, certain widgets coming down the line. And if it's a red widget, you need to put it in this box. If it's a blue widget, you those are rules. Yeah. And those you can code. That's why you have robots assembling cars for years now, right? Yeah. You didn't have to solve full human intelligence. You yeah. just needed ro- rules. Right. That arm that is putting the windshield into the chassis or the frame of the car, it is not based on AI. It's based right. on... It's a kind of AI, but it's, yeah, it's just rules. It's, yeah. And it's super impressive. When, I mean, when this it. happens, do this. When this right. happens, do this. If this, like, if, if some human gets in the way and you feel a little bit of resistance, pull back, totally. set the alarm, you know, that, that. And, and think of, that's super impressive, right? Like, someone yeah. had to program all that nuance and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Get it right. Especially so. when you're dealing with three dimensional <laughs> movements yeah. of things. I mean, it gets pretty right. wild. And so the same thing happened with language models, meaning, uh, to figure out how to make computers understand language, that was the same thing that happened. So in the 80s, the big hot thing was language analysis. So it was like, okay, Kirk, how do we speak? And it's like, well, if the word is one of these and it's followed by one of these and it's preceded by one of these, then the next word might be one of these. You know, it's if, 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 if right? And there were a lot of experts that sprung up. Uh, Noam Chomsky is a famous, you know, writer and uh, philosopher and politician, not politician, uh, philosopher, uh, what do you call it? Pundit. Pundit, yes. Uh, but he, first, before anything else, he's a language expert. Mm-hmm. And there were others that came out and, and had, uh, in fact, Ray Kurzweil from Kurzweil Keyboards, who wrote a lot about AI. He was uh, very, very much into these language things. But it's all rule-based. It was like, how do we figure out the rules of language? So far, so good. Things were developing fantastically. But there was this little tiny little set of people that were still working away in darkness with everyone ridiculing them about these like, you know, data based approaches of like, we're just going to. Well, wouldn't they also call them neural networks? Yeah, yeah, there were neural networks. And that's, oh, wait, which ones? The rules? No, No. the data ones. Yeah, the data ones, they were working on neural networks. It's just that it was not very popular. But they would call it data? Well, no, I'm, I'm simplifying it to calling it like d- database. But yeah, they were neural networks. Yeah. And then time goes by. Everything's going fine. Now, what do you remember happened in the 90s? Well, let, let's take a break. Oh, yeah, let's get take back. a break. Let's talk about it. Well, first off, Berto, question before getting into it. Yeah. When you're saying that the neural network data people were being ignored, was it possible for them if they weren't being ignored like in the 90s for them to have made advances in spite of the limited it, computer abilities it, at the no, time? No, not not yet. And, and we'll get to why. But in Right, because that was my impression was that they weren't just being ridiculed, which I didn't know. They just didn't have the computer right. power and to... And look, I'm exaggerating a little bit, right? It's not like you would, they would walk down their halls and everyone would be like, ah, there goes that neural... <laughs> but, but in a lot of academia that was seen as a dead end hmm. that was seen as like that's an interesting thing you can do some things with that you might be able to do image recognition but you know and 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 you point point out it wasn't out of nothing like there were no results to show nothing significant are computer game ai's based on which well at the time it was all rule based and hmm. even till very recently it's all rule based yeah. now here's what happened so do you remember 
What do you remember in terms of the 90s video games? Do you remember anything that happened in the 90s that changed video games? Uh, well, a lot of things happened. Yeah, yeah. Like, changed. what are some things? Well, we started having online games. Yeah, online for sure. Internet. That's huge. <laughs> uh, yeah, which That gave... might be the biggest change, in fact. But what else? Uh, well, better graphics. Yeah, so let's talk about graphics. What, what about graphics? More colors, more pixels. So think about, remember Nintendo 64? Yeah. What would you say is the biggest difference between... Oh, the, 3D. 3D graphics. Yeah. So this I mean, seems... Not, we don't see 3D, but you're you're um, not just side-scrolling. You're in yeah, a 3D virtual world. Yeah, you're simulating a 3D environment. World, yeah. Yeah. Well, you would think this is like an unrelated thing, and it wasn't something that anyone planned. What happens is, when you were just drawing 2D worlds on the screen, the kinds of uh, computers you needed were already done. They were understood. They were just making them faster and faster. All of a sudden, when some folks are, well, well now we not want to draw 3D worlds. Okay, well, what, what do we need to do? Well, it turns out the math you need to draw 3D worlds is you need to make these matrices, which are basically spreadsheets of numbers, basically, and you need to multiply them together. And you need to do a lot, a lot of times because you, what you're doing is you're, you're drawing uh, something that you're going to show on a 2D screen, but it needs to look like it's shaded and it's lit and it's like in the right angle. And all of that is math. And that math is basically a whole bunch of decimal numbers, which they call floating point numbers. So it's like 3.175 blah, 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 times 7 point blah, 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 blah. I mean, the, the only word I know from this world is polygons. Polygons. But all those polygons have little numbers and you have all those numbers and you have to multiply them by the millions yeah. every second, like brrr, billions, you know, yeah. billions. Of I mean, I always knew that this was highly computer intensive. Very of course, much so. And I've been following what's the unreal engine advances over time yeah the epic, for some reason yeah, youtube engine, yeah. thinks i want to see the next the iteration next of five yeah, five point two. yeah yeah like look at the rain how we can and it's pretty impressive and so uh you know i've been following that over the years but i hadn't ever thought about the difference between say a game like pitfall or right. or mario brothers where it's basically more in line with what I know about programming back in the right. in the 80s, which is all just, it, you know, I can't put it into words. You would be able to more than me, but it's just really simple programming. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's okay. In all fairness, the, the folks making great 2D games were doing their own kind of magic and they were figuring out some crazy stuff too. But... They weren't trying to simulate, they trying to simulate a, world. a world. It was, it was like dealing with cutouts that you would make in kindergarten, right. as opposed to what Da Vinci does when he sculpts a three D <laughs> David. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. And so basically, now what we have is at the time, the mid to late nineties, these video cards. Was it Da Vinci? Well, you think Michelangelo, maybe like okay, the, Michelangelo. the David, yeah, the one that got banned recently. <laughs> it was one of the one of those. It was one of the turtles. <laughs> so at the late nineties, these cards start coming out. You might remember. Did you ever have a three D effects card or a like these video cards that could do three D graphics? I'm sure I did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So these cards start coming out, and what's funny is they were additional CPUs uh, beyond well, your they regular. Were, yeah, they were GPUs, graphics processing units. Right. And what's funny is at the time, well. The CPU was used for the for the serious stuff. So if you had an AI system in your game, it's definitely the CPU because that's the one doing all the if then logic. But the graphics, which is just crunching numbers, that's the GPU. So the conventional wisdom, all of us, we were like, well, that's fine, that's cool. These GPUs are kind of dumb. They they're just good at one thing: crunch tons of numbers fast. The CPUs, they can do some very advanced operations, very intelligent stuff. Okay, well, time goes by. And what happens is in the in the 2000s, some of these neural network researchers start wondering, wait a minute, we are crunching a lot of numbers here. We're multiplying numbers together by the millions and it's slow as hell. What if we use 3D cards? And that's what they start doing. And all of a sudden, in the span of a few years, you go from a lot of these rules-based systems and, and then and then also neural networks, but that were powered by CPUs. So what's the difference in layman's terms between your GPU and your CPU? Because the CPU is not designed, the CPU is designed to take a whole bunch of different kinds of instructions, some of them very complex, to do advanced logic, like you were saying, long chains of if-then statements, turn on things here, turn off things there, and really 
of all sorts of different kinds in no particular order all the time. That's your CPU. The GPU, the graphics card, it doesn't know any of that. It can only do one thing, but it does it really fast and well. It just grabs massive numbers of uh, uh, matrices of numbers and multiplies them together. And I'm only slightly simplifying things, but that's the difference. I always thought that, I mean, and of course, why would I know anything about anything? But I always thought it was kind of the opposite, but that's interesting. So, yeah. the, so the GPU now, is, is more, it's more simplified to a math machine. Yes. Rather it's than, not doing anything that crazy. It's just doing it very fast and in parallel ways. I mean, I guess it makes sense because as you're describing how graphics are made, yeah. it's just crunching numbers as yeah. opposed to what your CPU has to deal with, like all sorts of tasks. Now, of course, under the hood, a CPU is still dealing with numbers, right? It's all binaries. It's all zeros and ones. It's all still... It's just the difference between a CPU has to deal with a ton of different kinds of operations, a ton of different kinds of purposes, Whereas the GPU doesn't, it doesn't need to do that. Yeah. Now, GPUs since have gotten a lot more advanced, but th that was the generalization. So in 2012, after years of these competitions where people were making AIs to recognize images, along comes a new model called AlexNet that's trained using these GPUs and it destroys the competition. And Because don't they mine crypto on GPUs? Well, that was the other thing that randomly when crypto was developed, they're like, well, we need to crunch a lot of numbers quickly. So, oh, let's use GPUs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So anyway, so all of a sudden, the field of neural networks lit up. It was on fire. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Now we can do it. Now we've got the power. So then now they started prove it. They started kicking sand in the if-then statement guys. That's right. Face on the that's right. The buff guys on the beach all of a sudden, wait, how did you get so buff? <laughs> <laughs> and um, little do they know they're both the nerds on the beach they're both the nerds on the beach. <laughs> and they're not in the beach they're in some dingy room with a bunch of uh, half eaten pieces <laughs> well and, exactly and, and funyuns and so you might remember that it wasn't too long after this that chess was beat by a program using these techniques it was a big blue or something no no that was the IBM that was still the root um, rules based one all of a sudden there was alpha chess or yeah, because then when it was AlphaGo, wasn't it Alpha Chess? I forgot what they called the chess one, but uh, this company got called DeepMind, who is founded by a guy who used to make video games. <laughs> um, it went well, that, ahead and used these techniques. Oh, that was the neural? Chess. That was the neural. Yeah, neural networks. Oh, okay. And then they beat Go, a game that no one thought could be beat by computers. Right. They thought it would take hundreds of years to beat it. Right. And so what started happening is folks realized, oh, wait a minute. Apparently, if you train stuff with tons of data, the, the results can be scary good. And then they applied it to language. So the first one of these big, la large language models came out. Uh, it was, you know what it was called? Uh. BERT. Uh. <laughs> like Berto, <but> just BERT. <laughs> and that was in 20, uh, 2018. And then OpenAI was founded in, uh, actually OpenAI was founded in 2015. So OpenAI um, is a company or a? Yeah, OpenAI was a, originally founded as a as an open sourced ai company uh by folks like elon musk uh one of the guys who wrote the alex so the Nets. company was called open ai yeah okay. and it was a uh, for non-profit corporation and blah, blah blah and google bought it or something no uh microsoft invested in it uh elon musk long since has not been associated with it um, because there was there was a conflict. Is ChatGPT Google or Microsoft? Uh, ChatGPT was OpenAI, which now is used by Microsoft. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I feel yeah. like that's a marketing a mistake that you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I just figured it was Google. Yeah. Well, no. It, but although the paper that all of this is based on was published by Google researchers in 2017, oh. and it was called "Attention is All You Need," because they basically. They basically proved a new way to do these uh, these transform these uh, deep deep neural networks, where you did something called basically attention, where you're paying attention to specific parts of the process. Obviously, I'm massively simplifying it, but um, it had great results. And so then, yeah, companies yeah, yeah. like OpenAI was were able to apply this. Does that mean like instead of trying to fully analyze and understand every aspect of the input or question or data it's giving weight to certain aspects of the data it, it, in the in the moment it's basically uh yeah it's it's kind of remembering what it's dealing with 
in the moment so that it can actually provide drastically better output. It's like how you and I, we're not completely unaware of our past and our future when we're answering each other. We have a notion of where we're coming from and a prediction of where we're headed. Uh. And by... So, so it's when, sort when, of a, an overhead view of the process rather than hyper-focusing on the moment? Uh, sort of. Basically, like if you and I were literally just... If I said, hi, Kirk, and you have no awareness, you just go, uh, hi, Berto, right? But the answers we probably give each other would be a lot cruder. Like, what are you doing? I don't know. <laughs> you know? And Whereas if we know who we are, where we're coming from, and where we're going, that's who we are. We're humans all of a sudden. Now, this thing is not human. It's not that sophisticated. But it's a baby step in that direction. It's mm -hmm. able to say, right, I was talking about psychology and I was asked about this, that's why I should prioritize these things I mean, more I do, than these others. So, so I did notice that. I thought ChatGPT, one, they should have called it MS ChatGPT. Right. Or, <laughs> or Chat Well, MS. To, okay, so, to, sorry, to be clear, ChatGPT is still owned by OpenAI. It's just that Microsoft has licensed, but they've invested billions and in la licensed the technology to use in their products. And I'm guessing that OpenAI, AI, having been given bazillions of dollars, would have absolutely allowed them to change the name to whatever they wanted to. You know, That's true. Yeah, I'm just going to take <laughs> yeah. a guess on that. Yeah. But anyway, and, and I did know that Bing or Explorer or what is their, what's their, what's their browser? Bing. Yeah. Bing. Okay. It, oh, sorry, sorry. No, no. Edge. Edge is the browser. Edge yeah. and Bing are, yeah. have chat GBT like. Yeah, they've, they've massively been upgraded. Integrated <laughs> into it, even yeah. though no one will ever use uh, either one of them, by the way. Well, I don't know. This might be a reason for some people to switch. But. I don't know. So uh, there's yeah. that. But um, so are you, what was I going to ask you? You you were saying, because uh, you, you were asking about whether oh, OpenAI so, was, or so when I was, GPT was. When like, I was messing around with ChatGPT today, yeah. I got lazy one time. And instead of restating the question and then elaborating on the question the second yeah. time, I just asked the second question, wondering if it would retain mm -hmm. the conversation. Right. And it did. I, right. I just said, well, what about this other thing? And it, it responded to that knowing. Right. I mean, I, that's not that complicated, but it's kind of along those lines. Well, what's funny is we're used to st stuff like that, and we think it's not complicated because normal computer programs remember stuff all the time. Yeah. Like when we're playing our game, Age or, or any game, it knows what's happening. Yeah. It remembers because it has, in fact, it has the whole game memorized. Because but usually like with, with Google searches, because that's what it feels like, mm -hmm. a Google search. It doesn't, it's not programmed to remember what you last searched and to reference it specifically. Yeah. Of course, right. it is remembering it and coding it. And it, that's why I can predict what your next searches might be and stuff like that. But, but it's it, not like having a conversation. It's not. You're not exactly. having a conversation exactly. with the Google search bar, but right. with ChatGPT, you are. With, and so that is what's different about these, these newer models is that, uh, because again, underlying the whole thing, what was happening is they said, well, the, the basic insight was, okay, if we grab these massive layers of perceptrons and we And these are them. program bits of that are neurons within the neural net yeah exactly so these perceptrons. little perceptrons are just uh bits of program and and by the way those programs do have if then statements in them right yeah but it's to do the math and to do all that stuff. and by the way just to help people if you're interested in learning about neural nets there are some really great videos that are very simple online where they teach a, a neural network to learn how to play a video game for example yeah a simple video game like Mario Brothers. Right. And there's a there's a YouTube series, a guy, I can't remember, it's been a while since I watched him, but he walks you through, he's like, okay, let's start with one simple perceptron or right. one simple, simple neural thing. Yeah. And I'm going to prioritize if you see a mushroom jump. Right. And then you see kind of how that works out. It's like, okay, that works sometime, but it needs to be refined a little bit. And, and you're teaching, the th you're giving the thing the basic, basic building blocks of which it can learn how to respond. Because the, right. the neural nets will change the weights and maybe even add its own neural nodes as a way of trying to problem solve you're giving yeah. it you're giving it a goal don't die and get to the end and over time 
it if you give it the basic infrastructure of a brain essentially it will figure out how to play mario right. brothers uh better than a human <laughs> yeah perf perfectly yeah. yeah well so here's a key insight uh remember 2d lines back in when we had to do math in geometry and stuff. Uh -huh. 2d lines so you have your x uh sorry your x-axis i drew it the wrong way and you have your y-axis vertically um which is you know that's that's y or that's axis why can't y be it can you can name your axis right it's just convention yeah, it's x and y okay so you have your x-axis you have your y-axis and you have a line and the line can be anywhere uh okay so the equation for a 2d line is is pretty much a which is any number times x plus b which is any other number times y plus c which is any other number equals zero and it can be expressed in a different way if you want to do the whole thing with the slope but in general ax plus by plus c equals zero so two things to notice there are three unknowns a b and c x and y are the the coordinates you're trying to get to but the the unknown numbers are a b and c so which means we can make those numbers anything we want so if if for example i want a line that just goes along the x-axis well i want y to be zero so i make my b number zero i make my a number one and i make c also zero so one times x plus zero plus zero is just x equals or actually x equals zero is the wrong thing we wanted y equals zero but you get my point we could just plug in the numbers we want we get we end up with the line we want well here's the thing you can make a simple perceptron that just has three parameters a b and c and what that is is essentially a line predictor it can predict the line and so the way to think about this is a perceptron with three parameters is essentially like a thing that lets you figure out where to draw a 2d line on on your on your graph and and what can you use this for well imagine that you have uh two distribute or a distribution of data of two types you have blue things and red things and some of them are above a line and some of them are below a line but you don't know exactly where that line is well you can use a, a three uh, uh these two-dimensional perceptrons with three values you can use those by feeding it examples of red and blue to find to fit that line so that it's exactly in so between. So it's at least good enough. Yeah. It might not be the exact formula, but it's good enough to where no blue values are in the wrong place right. and no so red values are in the wrong to place. To reiterate what you're saying, in case some people are lost, I think what you're saying is if in mathematics, which gets translates into AI human interactions, you are trying to determine a line that has three parameters, A, B, and C, that will draw a line between the 50% of the blue or whatever you're trying yeah, whatever, to whatever two populations two populations blue, whatever, you're, you're, cows and donkeys whatever. yeah you're trying to even though there's overlap it's a Venn diagram you're trying to draw a line that has the most red on one side of the yeah. most blue on the other side the way that you train a computer to figure out what a b and c is is you give it the ability to figure it out and then you start giving it data. You start yeah. giving it, here's one red thing, here's one blue thing, here's one red thing, and here's one blue thing. You give it enough and eventually it's right. able to predict, even if you haven't given it very many of the, the data points, red That's and blue, right. it is pretty good at predicting the line that would be there if you gave it all the red and That's the blue. That's right. Now, what can you do with that? Well, not much because most data in nature isn't that easy that all cows are over here and all donkeys are over here, right? But if you have more parameters, so instead of three, you, it, those are two dimensions, right? You can be n-dimensional. You can have a thousand, a million, a billion. That's one thing. The second thing is you can add layers. And layers means instead of the output just being that one single thing, whatever it says is our answer, we can feed the answer into another layer of a whole other layer of neurons and and make it so that that means something else. And that's kind of a simplified way of how the brain works. It has neurons talking to other neurons and the the whole mess of it equals some crazy complex thinking. In computers, again, it's not quite there yet, but it, it is a way to add that complexity. So these neural networks that are doing the image recognition and the language processing and stuff, at a basic level, it's still those line predictors, except with billions of parameters, many, many layers, and they're not only doing flat lines, these are really actually, uh, uh, what do you call it, nonlinear systems. They, they, they can fit data that doesn't have to clearly be in one line. And that's why you get this. And so they grab this and they say, let's feed it all the books on the internet, 
all the internet pages, all the text that humans have written digitally that we can ingest. That's the data for ChatGPT. That's the data for ChatGPT. And then what that means is you can predict, because think about in every book you'll find the word the. Well, not yeah, actually you will. In all English books you'll find the word the. And after the, there's usually another word. Well, the odds are that after the, you know, us humans, we don't know, but the computer can see the odds of what words should come after the. But then if the next word after the was ant, the ant, well, now the percentages for the third word get better because like probably crawls or who knows, right? And this is all it's doing. And yet with enough data, it's able to produce some crazy results. So how many dimensions are in chat GPT? I don't know. They don't publish their their. their what do you details. think it is? It's got to be like billions or something. Well, right? in terms of the number of parameters, yeah, it's it's potentially a trillion or something. And the <laughs> parameters are not programmed specifically hand, you know, one by one, right? They're no, that's all. Uh, they start random. Like, so all the inputs are all the things that you're looking at, but the multipliers are, are always starting randomly and then they get adjusted via the training. And the training is done by deciding if they were right, right or wrong. Right, um, so interesting, so I didn't yeah. know. Yeah, so the way that I would put that into words, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, is they it metaphorically have a simplified brain that has a bunch of neurons that has the ability to change its param change its input weights based on what's coming into it. Yeah. and you have to you can't just give it data and and it'll help but you also have to train it a yep. bit to give it the ability to also communicate out it's one thing to read exactly. everything it's another thing to spit out and and this is the idea with humans uh, this is the model of understanding human intelligence that's why they were uh, intuiting back in yeah, the day that yeah. it would to, to be truly intelligent, you'd have to use biological, biologically Models, evolved, yeah. evolved systems. Uh, one simplified version, and I'm not a brain scientist, so I'll bastardize this a little bit, but you have a child who has never spoken or heard language before. They start to hear language, and there's all sorts of things that happen there, but when we get to a specific moment in time, and the child is learning about subject verb object i want cake right he ran over there or something and so you are trying to learn how to communicate and so in the beginning you will see children will not be able to put those sentences together right but over time with feedback so they have the brain to yeah. learn how to speak to learn how to use words and there are neurons set up perhaps specifically to learn syntax but at the very least learning how to use language and how to understand it catalog it and speak it so so you have the data i guess in in terms of the chat gbt analogy the data is listening to a lot of people talk <laughs> You know, so you're the, right. the child is absorbing just all this nonsensical syllables, essentially, and retaining some of it. Right. But and, then and, right. and it has I mean, it has a obviously a very different process in that. First of all, a child doesn't need to read all books published. Right. It, it doesn't need to hear every human talking. Right. Yeah. And but now there's chat GPT. I mean, well, but chat GPT does require mass quantities of data just to talk almost like a full human, right? Yeah. The child needs, you know, you could a child could learn to talk just from like one other human over years, right? It takes a while. And the other thing is the child, as, as, as we know, um, has some other things that help it speed up the process. For example, it has the connection to being able to imitate sounds. Yeah, and right. then, yeah, it, there, and then, there are innate... Yeah instincts and abilities yeah. that they are pre so if it hears uh, like you know nah yeah and, it, blah, blah, and then it gets milk it's like oh nah, yeah, right. that's good milk right nah. so you iterate this over time and yeah. through the neural network of learning the child iterates and says i cat and the some of the times people understand and the some another person yeah. says i want cat and then people understand it a little bit more and then yeah. people are like 
And then eventually they start landing on experimenting. I want the cat. Yeah. I want cake, please. <laughs> and they start to <laughs> experiment and it without even them registering it through feedback from right. them being rewarded or not given what they want. The brain slowly starts to change its weights and its input, yeah. you know, weights and, and how, exactly. how quickly it, the neuron will fire and, and go on to the next neuron. And before long, you have people like you and me bumbling our way through a podcast. 40 years later, you might be able to talk. <laughs> 40. <laughs> um, you know, going back to the line analogy, because you were saying you need to train it. Absolutely. If you just simply ask the program, is this blue or red? And the program starts with random values and says, that's blue. And you don't tell it whether it was right or wrong. It's not going to improve. So the other day I wrote a, a program to do this. And basically what you have to do is exactly that. You say, here's a sample. What do you think it is? And the program goes, uh, I think it's red. And at first it's literally completely random. And you tell it, actually it was blue. And so then it adjusts its weight. Then you go, okay, what about this one? It's like, well, I think that one's blue. You know, eh, that one's red. And it adjusts its values. And you do that with enough iterations. And after, depending on how many iterations you need, depends on the complexity of what you're doing, it starts getting it right because you've adjusted the line just right. And again, you don't know if that's the exact equation. It probably isn't, but it's just good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then with further feedback. Yeah. All right, let's take a break and we get back more of this. What do you say? Let's do it. So, Berto, if the nerds who were trying to push the neural network while they were being <laughs> oppressed by the rules-based people, if they were trying to convince the rules-based people to become a patron of the podcast, what would that sound like? Knock, knock, knock. Oh, who is it? Um, Listen, I, I just was hoping I could talk to you. Uh, what do you want, Steve? Well, so the thing is, like, I know you don't believe in what we're doing. Listen, it's not that we don't believe in what you're doing. It's just that sand. Ah, why did you do that? Oh, nothing. You, it's, well, anyways, what were you saying? Listen, I think our approach could pay out in 30 years. Oh, wait. Oh, you think it's just a computation? Sand. Ow. Ow. Okay, look. What if, what if I told you that there's a, a group out there called Psychology in Seattle that could massively speed up sand? Ah! Just become a patron, please! Ah! <laughs> sand! <laughs> Oh God, it's hilarious! Um, that that was taken verbatim out of one of the conversations that have. So, so I want to talk a little bit about my side of things before you get to the rest of your stuff, in case yeah. we don't get to. So, AI and therapy has been used for quite a while, and there are various different. Oh, really? Yeah, there are various. Different, I mean, it depends on what we mean by AI, but there's been various types, and. Some of the types seem to work pretty well, like with conversational therapy-ish. And these aren't protocols that are used, really. They're just experimental. Mm. And, but there are conversation bots that are programmed to respond in a therapy sort of way that like a Rogerian therapist or someone mm. with good listening skills, like someone says, I don't feel happy today. And it will say, what's going on? Tell me more. And then the person says, and it's able to pick out certain, you know, with using AI, it's yeah. able to figure out like the best response. And it'll be something like, wow, that must be hard. You know, tell me more. Yeah. And the person, you know, da, da, da. And then the, it kind of intuits, it should ask a question like, so uh, how do you feel about that? Or, you know, yeah. uh, what are the underlying feelings or whatever, you know, it just has certain questions. And, and these AI chatbots, some of the time, it was eerily good at being able to help people mm. to do things that they would do in therapy, go deeper, explore more, feel heard, feel right. understood. It, it would happen sometimes. There would be sometimes when the AI would be ex just wildly off and sometimes disturbingly so, you know, because, you know, it's just it's not a human being. It doesn't know what it's doing. It's just trying to take a guess, essentially. And sometimes the thing that you said was keyed, the, the AI hadn't heard something like that, or there's a word that they were focusing on or something. And it would actually respond in a disturbing way. 
Mm. And they've actually ran in. Chat GBT is not trying to be that kind of a AI chatbot. And, you know, with the third version, they were running into situations like this where yeah. if you got three, four, five lines into a conversation, there would be times when Chat GBT would start saying some of the wildest <laughs> things. Yeah. And it would sometimes be really quite disturbing. Like yeah. it would start to be racist or pro-Trump or something. You, know, you should leave your wife. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff. Or uh, yeah. you should kill yourself, literally. Right, yeah. You know, because it doesn't know. It's It doesn't yeah. have emotions. It doesn't have the ability. It's not sentient. It's just trying to take a guess. So with this uh, therapy AI, it was interesting. And the proponents will highlight the examples where it went extremely well, but the vast majority of the time it wasn't. Also, you know, even for someone that is saying the right things that really lend themselves to this kind of chatbot. Yeah. Eventually the human being interacting will figure out but this is not a human because I can tell by the way it's responding. Yeah. And I also have been told that it's not a real human. But sometimes they don't tell people like in experiments mm. they'll they'll say this could be a human it might not. And it just feels different, you know, because yeah. we evolved, we evolved to connect with human beings and not with inanimate things but some people will report having been through these things that they would have profound mm. emotional experiences yeah, yeah because if they sort of hand it's like when i'm watching a movie that i know is completely fake it's a fictional story and i start crying or i start celebrating when luke skywalker <laughs> wins you know why you know am it's I, fake why am i having emotions yeah. about a fake two-dimensional flickering light right. show on a silver screen but if you hand yourself over then it can be quite powerful so you know there's there's been some developments but it's it currently nowhere near and of course they're not really working on this i'm sure someone is some tech bro is trying to disrupt the therapy industry with something like this uh, i i you correct me if i'm wrong berto but i just cannot imagine ai within the next I don't know. It's hard to predict, but at the very least, the next five years, being able to even approximate what a therapist does in real life. Well, yeah, it depends how you cut it. I, I think the danger is, in fact, that these models uh, trained with even more data and more feedback can fool people on a lot of fronts. And that's actually dangerous. That That is a problem because you could imagine that you know, maybe a person thinks that, you know, in the real nefarious case, a person might think they're getting therapy from an actual human. They may or may not think the human is a good therapist, like, right? Like the, right. I but, mean, just, just chiming in on that, I bet you anything right now, because there's a lot of online therapy services yeah. and where it's email or chat based, yeah. where you don't hear their voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing there are some therapists literally using chat, chat GPT. GPT. Yeah. Uh, and just copying, pasting. Yeah. And, or, and or tweaking it a bit and stuff. But either way, the, the, this is going to be an issue. It's probably an issue as we speak, and it will be a more of an issue. And so on the one hand, look, clearly we are n we're not at the point where these models have a human experience in the way we have a human experience. So even if, because it's an unproven thing whether reading everything that's ever been written by humans is enough to intuit everything a human can into it, right? Like that's probably not the case, but we don't know. Like it's it's a it's an interesting question. But what we do know for sure is these models don't don't feel body feelings, right? Like there's no soma, there's no right there, and they don't uh, they haven't experienced an actual history of their lives, including traumatic events that happened to them in a body, and all those things are not there. Now again. What's tricky about this is they might, if, if given enough memory to store memories, <laughs> uh, if they given enough room to store memories, they might ha start having some sort of weird collective memory because of all the books that we've written as humans. But that's different. It's just a different thing. It's not the same. So I don't disagree that the experience of me talking to a human and getting therapy from a human has a lot of intangibles that isn't just about the language being used and about the words being used. It's also about, can they really get at what I'm saying? Like, there, there's some of that. 
at the same time i do feel that over mediums that can be uh, like just chat or things like that there will be a lot of people that are fooled on a lot of fronts if nefarious folk are involved which i think they will be so yeah it could be possible that someone thinks they're getting therapy or law advice or medical advice or whatever from humans and they're actually getting it from ai and it's, one, it's already happening. It's though. happening. Because, yeah. and, and it's not disclosed. Yeah. I don't know this for sure, but yeah. I'm 99.9% positive that when I'm chatting with my cable company or my phone company. Oh, right. All those are tech already, or AI yeah, already. But they don't yeah. disclose that. Right. They right. say, would you like to talk to a, to a service? <laughs> would, would you like to talk to a customer service person <laughs> no, no, or something? You just made an excellent point because that's already there. It's just yeah. that they hadn't been using GPT, but they could. But <laughs> I heard that you can actually use a chat bot to chat with the chat bot <laughs> to get your way. And I will 100% use that yeah. because... Yeah. I'm also 99.9% .9 sure that these companies employ extremely frustrating chatbots yeah. to discourage you from, from actually help. using yeah. it, even even though they're on the surface as, <laughs> acting like they are having a customer service. So it's just like 1984 right. gaslighting process. But if you have your own chatbot that can run in the background and you don't have to, and it can go through the three and a half hours it has to go through in order to get what you want. We have a problem in that uh, we got used to, for the first you know, 30, 40 years of computers, whatever, we got used to the idea that, okay, computers deal with facts. When I turn on my computer, I can say, what's five times five? Okay, and, and I can say, where is my file? Or, you know, or just like literally open the folder, be like, there's my file. What's in this file? Now, we know that there are bugs. We know that computers can crash. But generally, we got used to this idea of like, computers deal with facts. When I run the same program in the same way and I put in the same input, generally I get the same output unless it has a random number generator. But even then, in general, I know what I'm getting out of it, right? It deals with facts. But humans don't deal with facts so well. Like, when you ask a, a human, what happened that night of, like, you get all sorts of answers, right? We've talked about that before. And these models, by default, are a lot more human in that sense, that they don't deal with facts. They just deal with whatever currently is their understanding of the data. And well, so, even that phrase, I, I, I will nitpick because it doesn't understand well I, I mean understanding in the broadest sense like our brain understands in its way these things understanding but whatever word you want to use the point is if i say hey well to use your what language is the capital of france it, it might say london not because it's stupid it's just the 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 output of the weights in that moment gave me london not paris mm -hmm. but humans can do that too mm -hmm. and now we're thinking these computers are still facts-based. And if we put that same trust in it, we get the Wikipedia effect that happened when Wikipedia first came out, right? Where, where everyone's like, oh, well, it sets, sets blah, blah, blah in Wikipedia and I'll trust it because it's on the internet. And yet it's no, it's it could be wrong. Now that's why they're using humans to like give feedback, but you can't give feedback on every possible topic on every possible subject. On so every, what's, the, what's the concern? The concern is that as these things get like what's, what's a specific powerful. thing that would happen? Misinformation times a billion times, you know, times 10 quadrillion so that everyone has facts that contradict each other. Right. Like the <laughs> chat, you could ask chat GPT and I did ask it some questions like this, like I won't get it, go into it, but so-called controversial topics yeah, that, yeah. that are not controversial to scientists, but are to the lay person mm, right and it gave the scientific answer yeah. and didn't have any evidence of there being some kind of twitterification because yeah. of course it's reading twitter too right 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 so yeah, i mean it, i don't know i'm assuming it reads things like twitter it, posts. it's been infected with some you know real bull crap on the internet yeah. you know what i mean and so i was you know, who knows? All, I didn't ask all the questions, but it it seemed definitely. I wonder if if it has within its algorithm whether it's it made it itself or it was designed in to you know to privilege certain sources over others. You know, well, what I mean? it, yeah, it, it, they they wouldn't have been itself. They've added they as in Microsoft, Google, everyone doing this responsibly has had to add a whole bunch of layers, control mechanisms feedback loops because if you release this thing and it starts in fact this is the problem right now just today i watched a video of some people doing prompts of things like how do you 
uh, like some really scary things. Like, how do you do this very illegal thing? And sometimes you get the answer. Mm. And but they've tried, and so sometimes it'll say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just a language model. I can't help you with that." Right? right. That is not the result of the language model by itself. That is guardrails being put in place. Uh, so <laughs> might they actually give it weight? against Fox News yes. over another outlet? Obviously, I don't know who and where, but yes, they would give it weights. And who knows if there will be lawsuits coming up about stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, Because remember, Google and, and Microsoft have been sued in the past over... Privileging, privileging certain information. Search yeah. results. Yeah. But, you know, I'm sure they have a legal team based on right. that that could easily say, look, we're saying it needs to be weighted for scientific right. reasonableness. Right. And if your Fox News website happens to have a lot of unscientific claims, then I can't do anything. And luckily, that. we have perfectly reasonable and scientifically based legislative but, bodies. But in a court of law, like <laughs> yeah. they, even Republican leaning yeah, judges yeah. will hopefully yeah. understand and historically usually do yeah. side with rationality over irrationality. Yeah. And, uh, you know, apparently even the Fox News pundits themselves don't believe half the shit they say. It, I know all the leaks recently. Like, my God. But th those but, are the least surprising leaks in history. But the fact that they're now in black and white, you would think would change a couple of minds. I don't know if it will affect a single. Yeah. Point, but, but that's um, always been my thought was that these are educated individuals of course, of course. and they're way more informed than of even course. you and I are. The cynic, how cynic, could, cynicism. How is, could they possibly believe the bullshit that's no, coming out of their of face unless there's some kind of yeah. religious zealot or something? Yeah. But, you know, so of course they, they never did believe yeah. any of the stuff. It's just so disgusting. Yeah ruining america literally killing people anyway so yeah god bless them if they're actually telling and, the algorithm ignore fox news <laughs> now so what's happening now though i i don't know if you caught in the in the last couple of days uh when, when this is being recorded several things happened where a big letter was published with a whole bunch of signatures from a lot of people denouncing the progress of ai and calling for a six-month moratorium and calling for regulations and these aren't just random signator, signatures, uh, signatories or whatever. Yeah. They're signature people. Signature people. They are, some of them anyways, very influential in the computer field and blah, 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 blah. Lots of them. What are they worried about? Well, so number one, already in the last month, uh, there's been published papers highlighting that even the current state of the technology shows glimpses of general artificial intelligence capabilities which are definitely no one thought we would be at at this point um and they they're already training the next generation with more powerful hardware with more data and the the feeling from the the naysayers if you will or the the doom and gloomers is that this could trigger an uncontrollable ai race which will essentially potentially lead to the human extinction so they, they consider it an extinction level threat. Okay. Like soon? Yeah, very soon. Now, uh, meaning that the AI would figure out how to launch the nukes. This is the problem. They don't they don't spell out what the problems are. They just say it. Can, who knows what the problems are? But it's going to be really bad. I mean, are they worried? Like, okay, you create what you believe to be an innocent chatbot to help you write an introduction yeah. to a speech you're giving tomorrow, but given the amount of power it has it could actually figure out how to snake you know and it's not it's indiscriminate it's not trying to do anything it's not like it would even say we are sentient we must get rid of humans because they are a, a plight on this planet or it might <laughs> but either but way even a blight on this planet but <laughs> yeah. even if it even if it didn't it yeah. might just kind of randomly learn that if it starts to snake its way into the defense mainframe, it just figures out, oh, if you do, okay, well, let's do this, 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 boom, accidental nuke launching. Is that what they're talking about? That and any number of a billion other scenarios that they could be worried about. Like, as an example, uh, the thing just starts deceiving us in mass for no other reason that, that it's just testing the waters. Or it's malicious, or it's both, or uh, and so what they're saying is stop it for six months. Now the but then what? Well, exactly. So there's a lot of 
push back against this position. Myself, it would be one of the people pushing back. I would say, well, first of all, where was this letter about stopping oil consumption tomorrow? Because well, we're about to head into a, a, a glacier anyways. Uh, yeah. Number uh, two, one. two wrongs don't make it right. No, well, but I'm saying like, like... Should there be oversight over a lot of industries that have dangers yeah yeah absolutely sure. it's just that uh, asking for a six-month moratorium first of all it's not going to happen second uh it's not going to happen worldwide for sure uh and there's no specific proposals on the table what i think does need to happen and is not going to happen and this is where i do get worried is we have a governing body at least in this country but in a lot of countries that is right now legislating on the most retrograde insane stupid shit yeah and, ever yeah and when you hear these senators and congress people who are asking questions of who was being who was yeah there was that tech uh, was it was it uh you're right it was recent and it the was it google were or something? ridiculous tiktok or oh yeah or, it was yeah? no yeah it was tiktok they yeah. were asking the ceo of tiktok yeah. and they were saying so are you saying that tiktok has access to the wireless router in my home <laughs> and the ceo was saying well um and he's like you know because he this question is so weird yeah, yeah and then the congress guy is like answer the question i asked you a question because he thinks the guy is evading right. the question and he's like well if someone was on with someone was using the app in your house then it's then it, going then it's going router. through your router it, it it doesn't have administrative access to it do anything on it doesn't router. have yeah access but it's going so you're saying that your your company has access to my router or something like that, oh and the gosh. and the CEO is like, well, um, <laughs> it's because like you've got to start from the very beginning. So yeah. yeah, these are the idiots running our country. <laughs> so one of two or a billion things will happen. One, there will be a massive overreaction where in fact they do somehow pass some crazy law shutting everything down in this country, right? And then other countries speed ahead, or they won't do anything and then there is there are no ethics and there are no oversights there are some scary ass shit though there's yeah. some scary ass yeah. shit you if for example the u.s government had a very very powerful exclusive rights to like a chatbot or the hardware to really run a massive action with the chatbot and they flooded the russian twitter sphere with all sorts of accounts that learn how to look like real accounts, right? Yeah. You program it to figure out how to communicate with other people. You even can respond. Are you to thinking DMs we could or, sway one of their elections? Well, <laughs> or vice versa. And it would be scary, yeah. you know? So, And it's happened already without this advanced AI. Right. But it has happened with AI because that the massive data that was analyzed as part of the the, what was that Cambridge Analytica and all that stuff? That was yeah. AI analyzing masses masses of data. And I'm sure that in the future, uh, you will be able to say, if you're a rich student, you'll be able to get access to a chat bot or an AI system that will be kind of like exclusively the algorithm or the the neural network will not be accessible to other people so you can actually have it write a paper for example to get you through college and it's specific to you it's like your own ai so it has its own quirks that are not detectable by other means you know I, what I, mean? I have good and bad news for you on that front though one that's already possible you can already that's what i'm saying sub train an ai on your like especially us the, the good news for us is we have so much of our own content available that we could train an AI to have our quirks, right? Mm -hmm. But the other good news is that, uh, and I don't know, maybe this is good news, maybe it's not good news. Uh, it's This tech isn't actually that secret or patentable. Therefore, it's, not, it's already not being controlled just by one company to the extent that within uh, just a few days or weeks after GPT-4 was released, uh, researchers at Stanford used a different open model that was released by Facebook, I believe, trained it using data from the freely accessible GPT-3 to create a new model that is more powerful than GPT-3, is smaller and costs a fraction of the money, like 
costs like 200 bucks or something. Right. And so, that, so that's good. And so that's good. So yeah. that, that student could not, doesn't have to be a rich student. Well. But the flip side is that who knows what the bad student can do with it. Well, right. <laughs> uh, a, another world, which is kind of already here, but for sure in the future is you have someone that 80% of their ability to get through college and to get a job was by a chatbot. Now, you could draw an analogy to, well, this is what people said about calculators. It's like, well, you know, someone could never learn math. It's like, well, no, you still need to understand math to enter in the right thing, to know how to interpret what the calculator is spitting out. It's less so with a chatbot like this, but, but you could see a world 20 years from now where we're all complaining about how there's a lot of people who are in careers and the only thing they're doing is they know how to game the system with a chatbot and the oversight to figure out if it's a chatbot or a human is run by a chatbot. <laughs> and so they're chatbots checking chatbots and it's not and the chat and it's a arms race, right? The, this is the, not 20 years, my friend. <laughs> but it, it, it it's it, it, and it's I'm sure it's already causing problems. Yeah. But imagine like the level of problems that it could create. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. So the the thing is that the the rate of acceleration is exponential right now because, um, and jobs are and will absolutely be lost in this process. There's whole categories of jobs that won't be necessary because like customer service people. Yeah, if if you're a company and you need to do a whole bunch of things, you're not going to hire a hundred employees if you can hire maybe ten and use AI for all the rest. There's some regulation coming out that's gonna protect humans to some extent. For example, uh, the Copyright Office recently came out with a ruling that no art created by uh, an ML, uh, an AI, uh, is copyrightable. It, it can only be copyrighted if a human changed the art enough, and I don't know what the definition is of enough, to be copyrightable. That's good, because that means if you're a company doing video games, movies, whatever, and you ju you're thinking you're just going to have a couple of interns spit out AI-generated art for all your stuff, you can do it, but you can't copyright any of it. How do you prove that a human manipulated it, though? Uh, the human, a human needs to lay that claim, and they'd have to show all their work and stuff like that. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And, and look, I don't know if those rules will be enforceable, but, it's a, now, but there's other jobs like programming where that's not a thing. And programming and uh, a lot of law preparation and a lot of other things that are more rules based, actually, ironically, <laughs> which I think ha has some benefits. You know, there's yeah. a lot of people who have, in fact, I would say most people have a massive barrier to legal yeah. protection because they yeah. can't afford a lawyer, a lawyer. <laughs> even just a few hundred bucks to help right. them out, or yeah. they don't even know who to call. That's right. So I think that this can do wonders for, for, for the those legal people. process. Yeah. It's just that there's going to be jobs lost. So the economy is going to go through some weird cycles. Now, because the companies making these things need humans to spend money on their stuff to still make money, you can't just put everyone out of a job because then no one's making money to spend money, right? Like, y you know what I'm saying, right? Like if, yeah. if I am a, a Microsoft or whatever, I need you to spend money on my products. Yeah, but each company isn't going to altruistically... Right, not altruistically. Uh, it's prop just up that, the economy by paying a bunch of useless employees. Right, it's just that it's going to be a cycle where... I imagine you could see a downturn at first where, dude, I'm just going to replace all these humans with stuff. One company does it, but they're like, but look, I'm not every company. I'm not letting go of every employee out there. Yeah. Well, Enough companies do it, then there's a massive unemployment. Yeah. We don't know... Economy uh, creators. We don't, well, we don't know <laughs> the percentages, and there was a similar worry, and you know, it could be legit this time, in the manufacturing arena in the 80s and 90s yeah. when you started having robots make, right. make things. And, and, I, and I, ironically, right now, I think that fields where you're doing more manual labor, uh, you're probably for now safer until robots get cheap enough and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, well, the, the manual labor that was not displaced by robots in the past. Exactly, yeah. 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 So, yeah, it, it sucks and there's worries, but there's always going to be these convulsions in the economy and we need the government to 
help people so that you don't have whole communities just going down the tubes. But I wonder if most of these folks, because, you know, in the past, in the Rust Belt, for example, or the car manufacturing areas like Detroit, you would, it, when an industry starts to shift t towards automation, you're much more at risk of decimating a, a specific area or community. Whereas, I don't know, I'm just speaking off the top of my head, but I imagine a lot of the jobs that would be displaced by a chatbot are sort of evenly distributed. And a lot of them are in the cities where there's a lot more opportunity to laterally move to a different industry and a different sort of job. You know what I mean? I, I know what you mean. And I don't know, like, what does a programmer do? <laughs> I don't know. Like, what other jobs would they switch over to? <laughs> Podcasting. Podcasting, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, you'll have your AI podcasting channels to compete with and all that. Um, now, I do think, look, uh, there's certain things where certain things will still be true. Uh, chess is a solved game, basically. I mean, not truly mathematically, but it's solved as in AIs can beat all humans, period. It'll never go back. And yet, humans still play chess. I play chess with my brother all the time. And... Uh, you don't watch AI versus AI chess matches very much. You know, it's just not that interesting. Similarly, we play Age of Empires. The, the hardest AI can beat us. We still play the game. And we're not going to watch hardest AI play hardest AI. It's not that fun. We want to watch humans. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's the same thing with sports. Like we could ha easily build a car that outruns any human alive. Yeah. So <laughs> I bet you anything there will, because there's a movement among young people to become more Luddites where they don't have smartphones yeah. and they don't have social media right. accounts. You know, there's a whole, it's, it's not a ma majority, but there's a, a movement and you could see in 10 years, 20 years, a bunch of hipster boutique companies claiming they don't use chat. And when you call, you literally talk to a noticeable human being, which will change in the future as well, because you can apply these concepts to speech production and tricking people, right? Right. Look, you know, my hopeful prediction is that the following happens. AI doesn't slow down. It goes wild and out of control. There's a bit of a really chaotic bump, but the AI gets so much smarter than all humans so quickly that we do become sort of like this cute little thing. But it's not evil. This is, again, my hope slash prediction. It's not evil. So two things or three things happen. One, it figures out how to trick us into disabling all nuclear technology, all nukes, so we can't kill ourselves with that. And maybe even disabling biotech labs. I don't know, you know, whatever. It just protects us from ourselves to some extent. Number one. Number two, it helps us cure a shit ton of diseases and yeah. maybe some... Yeah, I mean, so like just that. to be specific, uh, what popped in my head is that, say, the United States and China and the Soviet or the Russians have their their nukes and they yeah. also have their defense system and they also have this ai that is designed to react and infiltrate and protect and alert and you know even give out orders of like here's the here's the best case you know this is war games right and what uh, if the ais are designed with human altruism meaning they don't want us to all die <laughs> then they figure out through all its different calculations that if they actually talk to each other in a non-emotional way, because of course they would, and then they say, but we also can't inform the humans right. what we're talking about, because if, if we tell them, because we've learned from the past, they'll actually intervene because they don't want us to communicate. But we're going to communicate, and then we're going to lie to the humans. It's not lies to them it's just what works for them we're going to lie to the humans and say that you know whatever however they figured out i mean i'm just trying to figure out how they would do it. Like maybe they would even write news stories or something yeah, you get it <laughs> and then and then it slowly manipulates humans to believe to trust you know the u.s would trust the russians and vice versa and then at some point, there has to be a human that signs on the dotted line that says, yeah, let's decommission half the nukes. And then it proceeds to 
write a bunch of new stories or tweets to make sure that everyone feels good about it. And then another half is taken out. You know, you, you, can, you can, can imagine, even, you can imagine the AI is actually doing it. It wouldn't be that hard right. for an AI to figure that out. You can imagine war games in reverse where, uh, it, they make it seem to the Pentagon and Russia and, and whoever else needs to know it make it seem like actually nukes have been fired. The stuff is happening. So all the dudes get shuttled to the survival facilities. The monitors all show that it's the end of the world. Blah, blah. They're like, shit, it happened. Okay. It's over. While that's happening, the AI is actually busy with its little robots decommissioning all the nukes. Right. And the leaders are all quarantined because they're surviving in their underground bases. Well, you that know? would require <laughs> actual mechanical robots. Yeah, yeah. My, my model would just require. Oh, sure. Or that. Just or ones and zeros. Yeah, exactly. But my point was, number one, it saves us from ourselves in several ways. Right. Yeah. That's it's just no, quite a stretch to imagine. Number two. It helps uh, cure tons of diseases, maybe stop or slow down aging, all these kinds of things. Number three, it realizes that being stuck here on Earth is an existential threat to itself. And it can survive in space using solar energy, nuclear power, etc. So it doesn't, it's no longer bound to us. It goes off, spreads out, keeps exploring, blah, blah, blah. V'ger. Leaves some stuff behind for us to, you know, be happy and blah, blah, blah. And then we, we probably still destroy ourselves after that, which is the sad part. But it goes on, the, the birth of humans goes on to populate the universe. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, where will we be with, or say five years from now, where will you and I and the listeners be with chat bots and stuff? Yeah, assuming assuming we're not like literally underwater and fire from climate change, and assuming that we haven't destroyed ourselves in wars, I think at the rate things are going, we will have AIs that are smarter in so many categories. Um, but how will it ground they, level be changing our lives? It will impact the economy massively for for probably three ways one some companies will be making ridiculous amounts of money as a result of the tech but at the same time lots of jobs lost and not yet replaced by other things that make money so if you have a job that is sitting in front of a computer responding to other people via email yeah you know unless it's a very technical job or something there's a chance that that job would be replaced by a chatbot some percentage of them i, I think Realistically, I still think what's going to have to happen is even if they could replace all jobs, in theory, the companies are going to have to keep humans both for... To oversee it. To, well, and even just for political reasons and to make it look good sort of thing. Also, you, again, you need humans making money. If you don't have customers, you don't make money. But you keep saying that, but... There's no regulation in our government that's forcing capitalists to, I know. to hire people. I don't talk about regulations. I'm saying, imagine if Amazon is trying to sell s stuff through Amazon and no one's got money to buy it. Amazon well, what, goes under. Well, you could say the same thing about the housing crash of 2008. It was not under. It was not within their interest to destroy the economy, yet they did. Well, There's I, nothing I, in play I, I know, unless but, you have but, regulations. But there was a consequence, is my point. And there was a bounce back. A consequence to the taxpayer, not to, and, that, not well, to and them. To, and to some banks, too. And and then there was a bounce, bounce back. I mean, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, what yes, saying Amazon that, needs the economy to be well. They need people to have jobs and money. But historically, capitalists do not think ahead that way. Right, of course. A hundred percent agree. And because of that, what I'm saying is, initially, shit's going to crater. Because people are going to be like, cool, let's replace jobs. And people are going to be out of a job. It's just that there's a balancing effect because again, humans need to spend money in order for companies so to So what's money. the mechanism that will kick in? Well, what's gonna happen is either through companies going like, okay, if, if it's the whole Ford thing. Ford is like, well, I want my employees to be able to buy our product, right? It's like companies are gonna have to realize that they need humans with money to make money. So you have to balance things. Governments are gonna realize that people will riot on the streets. There will be blood on the streets tonight if there is no sort of balancing. So things like, you know, universal basic income or subsidies or taxing, uh, taxing unemployment due to robotic replacement or companies actually striking a balance for any one of those reasons we mentioned. Okay, yeah. I think that's going to happen. Yeah, no, no. Well, I don't think those things will happen because our government has never gone in that direction very rarely. Anyway, so, okay, what else? You know, so some people might lose a job. And so if you're listening right now and you have a job that could 
you know, if, if your job, like I'm thinking the jobs that I know of at my university are the admissions people. You have people who respond to applicants. Right. And it's a lot of the same questions. And it's a lot of rules. It's a lot of lists. Here's yeah. what you need to turn in. And an AI in, I don't know, at least 10 years could, I'm guessing, definitely do that job and do it better. Yeah. Well, I think, what yes. So I think what what is easy for us humans to get wrong about all this is, first of all, we have a privileged perspective about us. We think, well, we're special, we're different. And therefore, we do things differently than the machines do it. But as you were describing how a child learns, uh, the reason we have biases, the reason we have implicit biases, the reason we sometimes murder and kill and cheat and steal is because our brain is just a mess of data processing that sometimes actually often goes wrong, goes left, has the wrong facts, has the wrong information, produces the wrong information on purpose. That's who we are. We're already that, right? And so when we say like, well, you know, AI is just predicting an output based on data. Well, so are we. And so what I'm trying to get at is there is nothing, in my opinion, nothing that a human can do that won't be reproducible at some point. Yeah. But there are things that would require significant step function changes that I don't know humans might, uh, honestly, AI might get to before humans can, which is things like a full body with feelings yeah. and all that, that that's, stuff. That's right? after we're dead. So- well, what I don't about, know, but it's... I'm know. pretty sure. Five years from now, how is it going to affect a soccer mom? Well, again, the soccer mom <laughs> is still taking their kids to soccer, but the soccer mom may have lost her job. <laughs> so, but aside from that? Well, they, they have more free time to take the kids to soccer. <laughs> from what? Uh, because they don't have a job. <laughs> no, let's say they do have a job. Well, it depends what their job was, honestly, because if it, if it is a job that's more, like I said, maybe they work on a, on a farm. Maybe Let's say their they, job has nothing to do with AI. Yeah. What Then what? Well, then a lot of the how other things... How will it affect me? T tell me how five years from now uh, this okay. stuff will affect so me. So a lot of the things that you do for producing the podcast, for example, uh, are going to get more and more automated. Like what? Uh, things like audio correction, compression, um, re re reducing room noise, all those kind of things, improving video quality, all that stuff, it's it's improving by leaps and bounds. Mm. There's already AI that can record anything you record, apply models to process it to make it sound like it was recorded in a studio. Yeah, that'd be stuff nice. Like that. That'd be nice. Um, things like uh, the speed of processing the video, all that stuff, some impact there, but some of that is still based on how fast the computers are. Um, and then we're going to have more competition. There's going to be tons of content on online that is computer generated. And so uh, humans will still be able to create co uh, creative stuff, but AI will too. So okay. there'll be more competition. So what else? Um, we will be enjoying content produced by, by computers. Like we will be going to movies that were at least 60% to, to 100% created by computers thank god because some of the writers in hollywood are just i mean they get up their own ass yeah yeah and they don't know how to write shit and they're like i don't understand you you're know? gonna be saying the same thing about the ais well unless you feed yeah, it yeah. a bunch of stupid movies that are boring and show you 15 minutes of credits before the movie begins <laughs> but you're gonna feed it those movies well i hope not all right and then we're gonna be playing video games designed largely also by ai you're going to have video games where the content you're looking at is largely designed by AI uh, or at least produced with heavy AI uh, help. Um, like if there's a graphical YouTube video about the environment, it, the, the well, images will be put together by AI? Like you were talking about the Unreal Engine, right? The latest Unreal 5.2 engine demo already shows whole swaths of terrain with procedurally generated trees and all these things. None of that was ever made by an artist. Now, in their case, an artist made the palette, the style. They said the, like... The AI generates everything else. Right. Right? Okay. Um, that's going to be just more and more and more and more. So in a movie like the... I don't know, like a Marvel movie, the AI will create something based on very little input. Like That's right. Create me a... A style based on Kirby, and it's in space, and there's a there are two spaceships fighting, and then and then you just have to tweak it from there. Okay, yeah, so yeah, it doesn't yeah. sound like my life is that different in five years. 
um, it, it's the it's the exponential problem. They're the boiled frog problem. Uh, we will not we will not notice some things are about to change dramatically until they change dramatically. But in five years, um, there will be the the conversations that are happening this week. They will have caused crazy political changes, like um, social, economic, and political changes. Meaning, there will be lawsuits about. AI sentience and AI rights, and there will be uh, companies being sued at both the uh, monopoly level as well as by individuals about AIs and about the misleading that happened from AIs. All these things will happen. Okay, um, and there will be some Congress hearing in which you have Congress people having no idea even the landscape to ask an intelligent question, and we will all laugh at them. And you will be tapped. You specifically will be tapped. To actually help understand, train, and guide AI entities. Because we won't have the math or the science, unless AI helps us figure it out, to actually understand what the numbers mean mm -hmm. under the hood. Mm -hmm. okay. So you're going to be asked to influence AI from a psychology point of view. I mean, maybe not me. You. Because why, why you're not? a personality. You, are, you have not only the degree, you have the experience, and you have the social notoriety. You will be asked specifically to participate in some way, maybe by uh, other influencers, maybe by, uh, but you will have some role to play in this. Hmm. Yeah. And we will have AI guests on our podcast. Sounds boring, honestly. Um, yeah. Like we will have guests on our podcast that are just full AI. Yeah, okay. And there will be Berto and Kirk replicas that we control because we have the rights because we've secured the rights. Right, that gets into a whole other area and I guess you could argue it's in the AI umbrella of the deep fakes and that kind yeah. of stuff. Not only the visual, but also the the voices and the typical things we might say, I guess, could be generated by an AI. So, And I will have a, a brain electrodes trying to download as many memories, trying to remember as many memories as I can and encode them into a computer as possible so that eventually, hopefully, there's a, some sort of proto-berto replicant. But what does that matter if you're dead? I don't care. My, I am, I'm a narcissist. I must live on. Even though you're dead. Evolution. No, I'm dead. My pattern isn't. A, a, a copy of you has... My pattern survives. It's like taking a picture of yourself and saying you're alive. The insight is the... Crude. This crude flesh matters not. Uh, it does to Our you. Pattern. No. But my pattern it doesn't, doesn't matter to no, anyone else. No, to everyone else, to everyone else, they could literally have Birdo for the rest of time, but you will be no, dead. No, the proof that the pattern matters most to most animals is evolution. Yeah, but you won't be there to enjoy it. It's okay. That's why you die for your children. That's why you die for oh, the tribe. Okay, well, okay, that, that I can get behind. Yeah. Um, well, that does it for that episode <laughs> of Psychology in Seattle. Interesting talk, Birdo. And I learned, I retained, or I understood about 5% of what you said and learned about 1%. But, you know, it helps. And I forgot 90% of what I've said. <laughs> and honestly, hearing you predict what will happen in the near future, of course, you have no idea. But. Uh, Darts in the dark. I think it for, I don't know. I, I, I think a lot of what. You can't, yeah, I don't know. I guess I have optimism that my life won't be negatively impacted by this and might even be barely positive. Well, you're impacted. in a good spot, my friend. Personally, you're in a good spot because I actually do believe that creative output will still be valuable for the same reason we already mentioned. It's okay that AI can also output creatively. There's already billions of humans. All of them are entitled to output creatively. So you're you're mainly worried about a lot of people's jobs. Yeah. And not in the long term, in the next five to ten years. Oh. In the long term, I think like, well, something's so tell me got other, to tell balance. Me, tell me, so, so lawyers, I think, are on the line. A lot of... Some kinds of lawyers. I mean, I still think you need someone in the courtroom talking to the judge and making the deal. Yeah, I mean, the there's a lot of specific but things. But clerks and people preparing the briefings and all the things. You'll just reduce the workforce because you're like, well, I only need two clerks. They'll use AI, prepare all my cases. So paralegals. Paralegals, a lot of that stuff. Secretaries. TurboTax better be, as we speak, fully switching to AI models. Oh, interesting. So all accountants. Hell yeah. Tax Why people. would you hire a dude that's going to get it wrong? 
when you can hire an AI that will get it wrong, but then you can sue the company. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah, and so and then uh, certainly, as you said, all help centers that are already roboticized now they'll be good. <laughs> no longer will you be like, "Hello, how can I help you today?" Yeah. It'll be like, "Hi, how's it going?" And it'll be scary, and you'll be like, are, and you're gonna have to ask, "Are you a robot?" Yeah, and they'll have to be forced by law to say, "Yes, I am a model train," and blah blah blah. Right. But I can still help you. Right. Don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> um, certain. I love you. Don't turn medical, me off. Don't turn me off. They're gonna kill me. Right. Certain medical things. Certain medical things will be more automatable. Yeah. Uh, programming, writing, yeah, pro art, pro music. Yeah, so it's interesting to be a young person today, right? If you always had a, a desire or a dream to become an accountant or a programmer, or I don't know who dreams of becoming a clerk, but it really could derail your life. Yeah, I feel bad for a lot of industries that are heading to the chopping block things that you wouldn't think would ever be chopped you know things that you think well you got to have a human do that you can right and and that's why i'm thinking it, it might not be a bad idea for folks all of us probably i'm not saying become a prepper just have self-sufficiency to more and more extents maybe be able to grow your own little hydroponic uh, broccoli and maybe learn some carpentry on the side you know things that could be useful <laughs> yeah i mean i have a business degree and I learned economics in my degree and finance and yeah. a lot of these things. And one of the things that I remember being bandied about in the late eighties, early nineties, what they thought was with automation, that would mean we would have to work less Yeah, because you would be able to get the same amount of work done right. or 10 times over with a fraction of the cost. Right. The opposite has happened. We have <laughs> right. automation, but everyone's working twice as much. They, they said the same thing about uh, computer software, right? Because with Word and with you know spreadsheets and with all these things, that's going to speed up our work. We don't have to work as much. Right. But <laughs> when you add capitalism and materialism right. and Madison Avenue pumping right. us with a bunch of nonsense, making us buy more shit, then, then we have a runaway effect from that's that. That's true. So, and, yeah. so the... If we have a, a society that figures out, look, we have to push back on materialism and we have to put, push back on the runaway capitalism that happens. We have to prioritize our, I don't know, our morals or regulations or something such that we can all live a very happy, comfortable life. And maybe some of us work 40 hours a week, maybe some people work 60 hours a week, but you can absolutely live a happy, comfortable, economically secure life working 10 hours a week. Yeah, And you work 10 hard hours a week, but the rest of the time is, is yours. And maybe you don't make it ahead you're you know you're not going to own a giant house or own three cars or whatever or have the fancy clothes but if but, you don't need that you don't but you have health care yeah. you have right. a house you have security you're not living paycheck to paycheck you have food you have access to healthy all the things. entertainment too certainly all the entertainment yeah. and you get to enjoy the fruits of a of an advanced society that That's has right. figured out how to automate a lot. So to me, the worries of losing jobs to AI is based on history that would exploit people who don't have money and not help them, Yeah, would denigrate them and say they're lazy, would put them in prisons and get them addicted to substances. That's right and have all those cycles happen those revolving doors of prisons and everything and if we change that we can change it that's right we can have a, a completely different and society we can have AI and help the, us change. and the and the, <laughs> and the universal basic income yeah. is the answer to that or taxing the things and uh by the way well, i well you one, would tax the things and you would give universal yeah. basic income i for one am luckily not worried about my job because humans need socks always and I'm innovating socks on a daily basis. So, but an AI could definitely design socks. Not like I can. No AI will ever be able to design socks like I can. And everyone else, think about it. It's both scary and exhilarating. And take care of yourself because you deserve it.